Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week, so if you think that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. But anyway, this week we are going to be talking about a solved case from Swindon in England. In early 2011, a young woman named Sean O'Callaghan just suddenly disappeared after a night out with friends, and when she was reported missing, the police immediately jumped into action. It was a race against the clock to find her, and everyone was desperately hoping that she would be found alive, but people's hopes were soon destroyed when an arrest was made, and a confession led the police to Sean's whereabouts. However, this this case took a very, very unexpected turn when the suspect confessed to a second murder, a murder that the police didn't even know about yet. But before we get into the case, I would just like to say a huge, huge thank you to HelloFresh for kindly sponsoring this section of the video. HelloFresh are a meal kit delivery service that offers a huge variety of recipes every single week to help you get out of your recipe rut. I absolutely adore HelloFresh. Myself and my family have been using them for quite a while now because before we started using them we would always find that we would just constantly be cooking the same meals every week and we would rarely change it up because I guess we just didn't have time to pick out new recipes and figure out exactly what we needed for each recipe and how much we needed. But HelloFresh makes everything so much easier and since using them we've been switching it up all the time and making meals that we have never even tried before. And it's so simple, you just pick the meals that you want to try on their website and they will send you the instructions and a box full of all of the ingredients that you need for that meal. Which is amazing because not only do you not have to make a trip to the supermarket to get the ingredients yourself, but it also means that there is less food waste because they will send you the correct amount of ingredients that you need for the amount of people that you are cooking for. One of the main reasons why why I love HelloFresh is because I am a vegetarian but the rest of my family are not. They are meat eaters although I do cook for my family most weekdays alongside my sister and they have such a wide range of vegetarian options so I will pick a veggie meal for myself and then another meal for my family. But they don't just offer vegetarian options, they also have options for pescatarians, they have low carb options if you are trying to be a little bit healthier, they have have quick and easy meal kits if you don't have much spare time to actually cook in the evenings. And another reason why I love HelloFresh is because they are committed to giving back. In 2020 alone, they donated over 4 million meals to charity and they are continuing to step up their food donations amid the coronavirus crisis, which is just so kind and generous. So if you would like to give HelloFresh a try, then you can go to hellofresh.com and use my code, which which is 14 Molly to get 14, yes, 14 free meals and free shipping, which is such an incredible offer. So once again, that's the code 14 Molly for 14 free meals and free shipping. There will also be a link to the HelloFresh website in my description box. Again, thank you so, so much to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. And now let's just get into the case. So for today's case, we are going back a decade to the year 2011 in Swindon, which is a big town located in Wiltshire in the southwest of England. And this is Sean O'Callaghan. She was a 22-year-old woman born to parents Mick and Elaine on the 3rd of June 1988. Sean was one of four siblings. She was the second eldest child and her other siblings were called Liam, Laura and Aidan. And from what I can gather, Sean had a 
a very close relationship with her family, particularly her mother Elaine. She described how the two of them would often have little mummy daughter days as Sean was growing up. Sean's family described her as being a very bubbly, upbeat and happy person. She was one of those people that was very rarely in a bad mood. She was always a positive and vibrant character. She was also just a very likeable person. As soon as you met Sean, you just liked her instantly and you wanted to be around her. She had a lot of friends, she was very caring and considerate and popular and at the time of this case taking place she also had a boyfriend who she lived with and his name was Kevin. Sean worked as a personal assistant in an office which by all accounts she really enjoyed and Sean just had a good life. She had a good family, she had good friends, she had a stable loving relationship with her boyfriend, she was happy in her career. She honestly had so much going for her and so much to look forward to in life which is why it was such a shock to everyone when she just suddenly disappeared one night in March of 2011. The day that Sean O'Callaghan disappeared was Saturday the 19th of March 2011 and the night before this, so the 18th of March, Sean had decided to go on a girls night out with some of her friends and they went to a nightclub called Suju in Swindon's Old Town, which was a club that Sean went to often with her friends because it was not too far away at all from the place she lived with her boyfriend. It was about half a mile away. So she went to the nightclub with her friends. They were having a couple of drinks and just having a really nice time. And then in the early hours of Saturday morning, Sean became separated from her friends and she decided to leave the club and go back home. However, Sean Sean never made it home that night and after leaving the nightclub she was never seen alive again. Her boyfriend Kevin became very very concerned about Sean when she just suddenly stopped replying to his text messages. They had stayed in contact pretty much all evening they had been texting each other and the last text he received from her was at 1.24 a.m when she messaged him saying where are you? Kevin replied to that text where are you about two Two hours later after waking up and he said that he was just at home in bed however Sean never replied to this message and so Kevin texted her again about an hour after this just saying worried but still there was no reply and at this point he really started to panic he had no idea where Sean was and why she wasn't responding to his text messages this was incredibly out of character for her and so when the sun rose the following morning Kevin got in contact with the police and he reported his girlfriend as missing. Wiltshire police immediately jumped into action and launched a missing persons inquiry and one of the first things they actually did was check in with local hospitals to see if Sean was there. Maybe she had been involved in some kind of accident the previous night and she was receiving treatment somewhere but it turns out that that wasn't the case. No hospitals had a record of her being there. They also got in contact with Sean's friends and family to see if they had heard from her or if they knew where she was. They didn't. And they started looking along the route that Sean would have taken to get home that night to see if they could find anything, any trace of her, but they found nothing. There was no sign of the 22 year old. And it soon became clear that this was very, very serious because of how unlike Sean this was. She was not the kind of person to just go off somewhere and not tell anyone where she was going. She had never done anything like this before so the police were very concerned pretty much right from the beginning that foul play was involved in her disappearance. And so because of how serious and high profile this inquiry was, Sean's case was quickly handed over to Detective Superintendent Stephen Fulcher. One of Wiltshire's top detectives who had worked on many major crime investigations in the past. Now as part of this missing persons inquiry the police looked through Sean's mobile phone records and they were able to determine that when Sean sent her last text to her boyfriend at 1.24am the text that said where are you that text was bouncing off a telephone mast in Swindon near the nightclub so that indicated that she was in the nightclub when she sent that last message. However a couple of hours later when her boyfriend texted her it was found 
that her phone signal was now bouncing off another mast over 10 miles away in Savanac Forest, which is a huge wooded area in Wiltshire, which was very, very concerning because Sean had absolutely no reason to be 10 miles away in Savanac Forest that night, and yet her phone signal indicated that that's where she was. And so, of course, as you would expect, most of the search efforts from this point on were very much focused on Savanac Forest. They were going to be searching it for any trace of Sean. But this was going to be difficult and very, very time consuming because, as I said, Savanac Forest is a huge, huge area. It's about 4,500 acres of countryside. So searching the whole of it was going to take time. And it was time that they didn't really have in this case. If Sean was still alive somewhere in the forest, then she needed to be found quickly. However, thankfully, the police were not alone in their searches. Sean's disappearance very quickly grabbed the attention of the public and the media following an emotional television appeal given by her boyfriend and family. And as a result of this, hundreds and hundreds of people, I think actually thousands of people, volunteered at their time to assist with the searches of Savanac Forest, which was a huge help for the police. It meant that they could cover more ground and hopefully find Sean faster. Meanwhile, as all of this was going on, well, one of the first things that they did in this case, actually, was the police went through the CCTV footage from inside and outside the Suju nightclub on the evening that Sean went missing. Now, Sean was last seen on the footage inside the nightclub at around 2.52 a.m. that Saturday morning. By this point, I think her friends had already left, and so, as you can see from the footage, she was alone when she left the club that night. And then after she leaves the club, you can see Sean walking along the road in the direction of her home. But as we know, she never made it home that night, so something must have happened to her at some point on her route home. Now, if you look closely at this footage of Sean walking down the road, you'll notice that as she walks further away, a bright light appears, and that is the headlight of a vehicle that was clearly coming towards her. Now, the police were able to tell that after Sean walked into those headlights, the vehicle was stationary, it wasn't moving, for just over a minute, and then the car drove away. However, the police were able to determine that Sean never made it past that point. She wasn't caught on any other CCTV cameras farther down the road, and she wasn't seen again after this, which means she must have gotten into that car. So if Sean was abducted that night, then the driver of the car was more than likely her abductor. So now not only were the police looking for Sean, they were also looking for this car. If they can track down the car, they can track down the owner, and maybe this will lead them to the truth about what happened to Sean that night after she left the club. So this CCTV footage was shown to experts who are able to identify the make and model of cars, and they believed that this car on the CCTV was a Toyota Avensis 2007 model. However, unfortunately, they couldn't determine the license plate of the car. They couldn't see that on the footage. But as the police were looking through other CCTV cameras in the area, they actually found even more footage of the car. And in this footage, you can see that on the side of the vehicle, there seems to be like a yellow square, which the police thought was maybe like a taxi number. So maybe the car that Sean got into that night was a taxi. I mean, it would make sense. Maybe she didn't want to walk home on her own in the early hours of the morning. And so she got into a cab. But maybe the driver of this cab was a predator and did something to her. So anyway, the police carried on looking at all of the CCTV footage in the area. And one of the CCTV cameras actually picked up footage of a police car driving around around Swindon that night. Now, all police cars have dashboard cameras in them, and so the police decided to track down this exact police car that was seen on the footage driving around, and they were going to have a look at the footage from this car's dashboard camera to see if maybe this police car passed the car that Sean got into that night at any point, and it did. Just a couple of minutes before Sean went missing, the police car camera captured a Toyota 
offensive 2007 car driving past and thankfully through this footage they were able to make out the number plate so now using the number plate they could track down the owner of the car and when they did they found out that the registered owner was a man named Christopher Halliwell he was a 47 year old man from Swindon and he lived there with his partner and children he was a father of three he worked as a local taxi driver and he was pretty well known around the area as one of the local taxi drivers and people trusted him to pick them up and drop them off safely so he wasn't someone that was really on the police's radar he wasn't an obvious suspect in this missing persons inquiry but it was his car that the police believe Sean got into that night and so because of that he was an immediate person of interest and they had to investigate him however instead of questioning him or arresting him the detectives decided that they were just going to watch him for a while because if he had abducted Sean and she was still alive somewhere then he might go to where he was keeping her captive he might lead them straight to her so they put him under 24 hour surveillance and they also looked into what he was actually doing on the night of Sean's disappearance now Halliwell worked for a taxi firm a taxi company so the police got a hold of the taxi firm's like records from that night and it was found that Halliwell was working that evening he was doing taxi fares however he told the firm that he was booking off duty at around 1 30 a.m that night he was not going to take any more customers after 1 30 a.m that was going to be the end of his shift and then he was going to go home because he was tired but that clearly wasn't the case he had lied because his car was spotted on the cctv just before 3 a.m driving around the town and it's believed that sean got into his car after she left the nightclub and she left around like 2 50 a.m so this only made him look more suspicious he told his work that he was going to finish at 1 30 a.m and yet almost an hour and a half later it appears as though he is still driving around in his taxi looking for people to pick up was he cruising around the town looking for a young woman to abduct and Sean just happened to be that woman the first woman he came across on her own so as I said the police put Christopher Halliwell under 24 hour surveillance and they just started watching him constantly watching what he did and he got up to some pretty odd things well odd given the circumstances on the following tuesday night so this would have been a couple of days since sean was last seen he was spotted sticking missing posters of sean on the back of his taxi and i mean how eerie is that if he did have something to do with whatever had happened to sean it's just so chilling that he would put her missing poster in his car but not only that he was also spotted cleaning the back of his car specifically behind the passenger seat of his car and he was cleaning it with some kind of blue liquid and then he was spotted putting some items in litter bins in different spots around the Swindon area and I don't know what these items were I don't know if they were ever recovered by the police and in addition to that he was also spotted burning some car seat covers in the middle of the night not sure why he would have to burn car seat covers in the first place let alone in the middle of the night unless he was trying to hide something and destroy some kind of evidence that was present on them all of this was just incredibly incredibly suspicious so the police were certain by this point that Christopher Halliwell must have been involved in Sean's disappearance but they still didn't want to arrest him just yet because they still hadn't found Sean and they were still hoping that he would lead them to her whilst they were watching him under surveillance but by Wednesday there was still nothing no sign of Sean and so detective Stephen Fulcher the detective that was leading this inquiry he hatched a plan he basically had a hunch that if Sean was no longer alive if Halliwell had killed her and dumped her body somewhere he had a feeling that he might have 
left her near a place called Barbary Castle in Wiltshire, which is not too far from Savannah Forest, where her phone signal had pinged from. I'm not sure exactly why Detective Fulcher thought this, but he just had a hunch, he had a feeling, and so his plan was to almost trap Halliwell by leaking a few details about the police searches to the media. He basically told the media that they had narrowed down the searches for Sean to a few specific areas, I believe one of which was Barbary Castle. Detective Fulcher thought that if he released this information to the media, Halliwell might hear it on the TV or the radio or something, and if Sean was dumped or buried in one of these specific areas, it might prompt Halliwell to to return to it and try to move her body somewhere else. And because Halliwell was under 24 hour surveillance, the police would catch him doing it straight away. They would catch him in the act. So they set about doing this, leaking the details to the media. However, on Thursday the 24th of March, so about five days after Sean was last seen, the investigation into Christopher Halliwell took a turn. That Thursday morning, Halliwell was spotted by the surveillance team Team, leaving his house, getting into his car and driving away. And so they followed him obviously and he went to I think a chemist and a supermarket where he purchased quite a lot of paracetamol, enough paracetamol for an overdose. It looked like he was going to try and kill himself. Maybe the leaked details to the media really scared him. He realised that the police were getting closer and closer to finding Sean and discovering the truth and he panicked and decided to take his own life so that he wouldn't have to face the consequences of what he had done. And so at that point the police had to stop just watching him and they had to step in and arrest him. They couldn't risk him killing himself because if he did then they might never find Sean. And so he was arrested then and there in a supermarket car park in Swindon. Now normally when someone is arrested they are just taken straight to the police station for an interview. However Halliwell was arrested on suspicion of kidnap, the kidnap of Sean O'Callaghan. And that meant that the police were allowed to conduct what is called an urgent interview in the back of the police car because this case was very very urgent. Sean might still be alive somewhere and if she was they needed to find her urgently. So they began interviewing Halliwell in the back of the police car. They were asking him questions like is Sean still alive? Can you tell us where she is? But he kept very quiet and just replied with no comment to every question. Now at this point in time the head of the investigation Detective Stephen Fulcher was wasn't actually with Halliwell. He was located at a police station and Halliwell was arrested in the car park and interviewed by other police officers. But Steve Fulcher decided to extend the urgent interview because he wanted to interview Halliwell himself before taking him to the police station. And so he told the officers that had apprehended Halliwell to drive to Barbary Castle, the place where Detective Fulcher had a feeling Sean was and he was going to meet them there. So they met there at Barbary Castle at around 12pm that day, about two hours after the arrest and Steve introduced himself to Christopher Halliwell and he had another officer named Deborah Peach basically just record the whole interview. She was going to write down everything he and Halliwell said. So Steve started talking to Halliwell. He asked him, again, similar questions to what the other officers had asked him, like, is Sean still alive? Are you going to tell me where she is? But once again, Halliwell wouldn't really say anything. He was keeping very tight-lipped and still replying with no comment. And so Steve basically just said to Halliwell, look, you've got two options here. Either you keep doing what you're doing, you say nothing, you deny you had any involvement in Sean's disappearance and we take you to the station anyway and charge you and you'll be vilified in the media and the press because everyone knows that you've done this or you do the right thing you tell us the truth about what happened to Sean and you assist us with our inquiry and at least then everyone will know that in the end 
you did the right moral thing. And very, very surprisingly, Halibar chose the second option and he said to Steve Fulcher, quote, have you got a car? We'll go. He was going to take them to Sean. Halliwell told the police to drive to a place called Uffington in Oxfordshire, which is about half an hour away from Swindon and about 15 miles north of Barbary Castle. Once there, they drove down a remote country lane that had a deep embankment next to it on the left-hand side. And Halliwell said that it was there where he rolled Sean's body down the bank into a ditch. So police teams were called in to search the area for Sean and it wasn't long before they found her. That same afternoon her dead body was discovered in a ditch and the heartbreaking news was broken to her family. However it actually turns out that that wasn't the location where Sean was killed. Halliwell told the police that that night, the night that Sean went missing, he picked her up in a taxi and drove her to Savanac Forest which if you remember is where her phone signal indicated she was and there he stabbed her with a knife she was stabbed twice in the neck and also in the head and as she lay dying he strangled her to finish her off now I just want to quickly say that I don't know if Sean was sexually assaulted that night because some sources said that she wasn't whereas others said that she was although I do believe that she was partially clothed when she was found so you know we can probably assume that she was assaulted in some way and he actually left her body there in Savanac Forest where he killed her he hid it there but he later returned when he realized that the forest was being searched by the police and the volunteers so he returned very very late one night I think it was the Monday night after her disappearance so this was before he was put under 24-hour surveillance he went back to the forest he picked up Sean's body and moved it to the ditch in Uffington. So now that they knew where Sean was at last, Detective Stephen Fulcher was getting ready to take Halliwell to a police station. However, it was at this point that Halliwell said he wanted to have a chat with Steve. It was almost like he wanted to get something off his chest. And so they got out of the car and they stood outside breathing in the fresh air and it was clear that Halliwell was quite upset. He kept saying things like, what's the matter with me Steve there's obviously something wrong with me I'm sick I need help I can't be normal if I've done something like this and then Halliwell said something that was a complete and utter shock to detective Stephen Fulcher something that would completely change the course of this investigation he said to Steve Fulcher quote do you want another one another one meaning another body by saying do you want another one Halliwell was agreeing to take the police to another person that he had killed which like I said was just such a shock to detective Stephen Fulcher he thought that they were just dealing with one murder but now Halliwell had said that he had killed before Sean O'Callaghan wasn't his first victim some sources online actually say that Halliwell only agreed to take Steve Fulcher to the location of a second body if they gave him a cigarette which is just so chilling the fact that the body of someone that he had killed is almost worth as much as just a cigarette to him but I'm just going to pause the actual case here for a second and tell you a little bit more about Christopher Halliwell's background and his upbringing and his life leading up to this point. Sorry if it feels a bit sudden just putting this part in here. I couldn't really find like a natural way to slip it into this video but I didn't want to just leave it out because when talking about these cases I think it's really important and interesting to look at a killer's past to see what happened and see if we can identify what influence them to commit such horrific crimes. So Christopher Halliwell, he was born in 1964 in Swindon in England. However, in his childhood years, he actually moved with his family to Scotland. And then obviously years later, he would move back to Swindon where this case took place. Now I couldn't find the names of Christopher's parents. In fact, I don't know if his father was even an active part in his life, but his mother was, although she was a 
terrible, terrible mother and she treated her son very badly. She was horrendously abusive, both physically but also I think just mentally and emotionally as well and Christopher was beaten a lot during his childhood. She would beat him with a belt and she would press a hot iron on his hand and the whole time while she was doing this, while she was inflicting this pain on her son, she would just look at him and smile. Christopher was growing up around all of this abuse and so I imagine in his brain he would have thought that this level of violence was normal because he didn't know any different. He later said that his mother's abuse had a lifelong impact on him, as I'm sure it would any child, and it's been theorised that he saw all women almost as like a representation of his own mother. His mother was a woman that was horrible and violent and abusive towards him for years and years and so in his mind all women were just like her and so when he was older and bigger he decided to get revenge on his mother by being violent towards women and targeting women that weren't his mother. But going back to his youth, so in his childhood years one of the things that Halliwell liked doing was actually torturing animals which I'm sure is no surprise to you that is something that we see a hell of a lot in killers and serial killers backgrounds. Before they start torturing and killing humans they do it to animals and they get enjoyment out of it. In particular Christopher Halliwell took pleasure in killing insects and he would take his time with this. He would pull each leg off of an insect one by one and he would pull the wings off butterflies and he loved it. When Halliwell was 15 years old his mother placed him in a care home and when he eventually left the care home when he was an adult he started committing crimes and when he was 19 years old he was arrested and convicted for committing a burglary and for this he was sentenced to four years in prison and it was during his time in prison that he would talk to his cellmate about murder about how he would fantasize about strangling a woman during sex and killing her and he actually asked his cellmate on one occasion how many people you would have to kill to become a serial killer which kind of gives us an insight into how long Halliwell had been thinking about killing it wasn't a spontaneous thing that he just decided to do one day his murders were somewhat premeditated when Halliwell was eventually released from prison he he really struggled to hold down a job. He would constantly go from job to job. At one point he worked as a chauffeur, then he was a bin man, then he was a window cleaner. He changed careers a lot. And I don't know the reason for this. I don't know if it was just because he was fired a lot from his jobs or maybe it was a personal thing. Maybe he just didn't enjoy the work that he was doing and so he tried something different. But eventually he did start working as a taxi driver, which he did right up until he was caught in 2011. But as we know he got married and he had three children with his partner and on the outside he appeared to be this respectable family man but in reality he was not a good husband. He started having affairs with I think multiple women and he regularly slept with sex workers behind his wife's back which we'll talk a bit more about later on. But yeah as I said most people that knew Halliwell just saw him as this respectable nice family guy in fact one of his neighbors described him as being a quote smashing bloke he was great at acting like he was a normal good person that got along with everyone no one knew the real christopher halliwell who was a sadistic individual that had fantasies about murdering women at least that was until he turned his fantasies into a reality so now jumping back to where we were before in the case. Halliwell had just admitted to killing another person before Sean O'Callaghan and he agreed to take Detective Stephen Fulcher to the place where he buried them. Halliwell told Steve Fulcher that this second body was that of another young woman. He said that she was a sex worker that he had abducted from Manchester Road in Swindon and killed. He claimed that he couldn't recall the name of this young woman nor could he recall the actual year that he kidnapped and killed her. He said that he believed it was either 2009 
2003, 2004 or 2005, but he could remember where he had buried her body and as I said, he agreed to take the police there. He took them to a place called Eastleach in Gloucestershire, which is about 17 miles north of Uffington, where Sean's body was found. And there in Eastleach, he took Detective Fulcher to a field. And in this field, he pointed to the spot where he had buried this other young woman after strangling her to death. Following this, Halliwell was finally taken to a police station where he was given access to a solicitor. Meanwhile, the police were conducting searches inside his property, inside his home, and they also began searching the field where Halliwell claimed to have buried a second victim. And that is exactly what they found in the field. Eventually, they recovered a second body. However, by this time in 2011, the body was literally just skeletal remains. It was clear that whoever this was, they had been buried there for a number of years. And so identifying this person was going to be difficult. But after one of the bones was sent off for DNA analysis, the police discovered the identity of this person. This second victim was a young woman named Becky Gordon Edwards, who had been missing for eight whole years. Her family had searched for her for eight years, and the whole time she was lying dead in a field. Becky Gordon Edwards was a 20-year-old woman who was born in 1982. Her mother was called Karen and her father was called John. Although Karen and John were not together at the time of this case taking place, they split up about six years after Becky was born. And Karen eventually began a relationship with a man named Charlie. So he was like Becky's stepfather. From what I can gather, Becky was incredibly close with her mother Karen. And Karen says that she remembers the day Becky was born as just being the most beautiful day. Karen was so, so happy with her baby girl. Karen already had a child before Becky, a little boy named Stephen, and Becky's arrival in 1982 just really completed the family. Growing up, Becky was a very bright and intelligent child. She really enjoyed reading. She was always top of the class, and this carried on right up until she reached high school, I believe. But in her early teenage years, Becky started getting bullied by other pupils in her school and this bullying was really really bad. On one occasion these bullies took Becky's cardigan off of her and they rubbed it in dog poo and then forced her to put it back on which is just horrible and when Becky's mother Karen found out about all of the bullying she was furious understandably and she took Becky out of that school away from the bullies and she started at a different school. However unfortunately there were bullies at this new school as well that targeted Becky as soon as she joined. She really had an awful time at school and unfortunately the bullying led to a lot of mental health issues for Becky and these mental health issues led to Becky self-harming. And at age just 13 she tried to take her own life. Thankfully Becky survived this suicide attempt but she was never the same after this. She really really struggled mentally and this eventually led to her using drugs to cope with the pain that she was in. I think for Becky it started with her using recreational drugs but she soon turned to using harder drugs such as heroin and she developed a really bad drug addiction and when her mother Karen confronted her about her drug use Becky ran away from home and this is something that she would do frequently over the years. She would run away and then she would come back home and then she would run away again and her family particularly her mother would beg literally beg Becky to just stop, stop using drugs and come home. But of course for addicts it isn't that easy. And things only got worse when Karen received a phone call from Becky in prison. You see Becky had committed a burglary and she had skipped bail and so there was a warrant for her arrest and instead of handing herself in she panicked and went on the run. But eventually the police caught up to her and she was arrested 
and she spent three weeks in prison before her court hearing. Following her court proceedings, she was charged £125 and she was released on probation. And Karen was really, really hoping that this would be a turning point for Becky. This would make her realise that she needed to try and sort herself out and get some help and get her life back on track. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. It wasn't long before Becky was back on the drugs and she started working as a sex worker to fund her drug addiction. Her mother pleaded with her again to just come home and get some help, but Becky didn't. And in the year 2002, she told her mum that she couldn't keep putting the family through all of this and she would return home when she had sorted herself out on her own when she had gotten clean but that was the last time her mother ever saw her daughter again in 2002 Becky never returned home after this and soon weeks turned into months and months turned into years and the family never heard from Becky not even once they searched for her relentlessly over the years at one point her mother Karen even reported her missing to the police but the police didn't really take it very seriously because this wasn't totally out of character for Becky. She did run away from home often and she would always eventually return so the police just assumed that that is what would happen at some point she would return home but of course she never did, she never did return home and it wasn't until 2011, eight years after she was last seen, that her family found out why. It was because she was murdered by Christopher Halliwell. The last time Becky Gordon Edwards was seen alive was on the 3rd of January 2003 and she was out that night with friends. They were on a night out in Swindon. However, in the early hours of the morning, she left the nightclub that she was in and she got into Christopher Halliwell's car on her own. He was just out on the streets that night driving around. Now, despite Christopher Halliwell claiming that he couldn't remember Becky's name when he took Stephen Fulcher to the location of her body, it actually turns out that he wasn't a stranger to Becky, so he had probably lied about that. Like I mentioned earlier, Becky did work as a sex worker to fund her drug addiction, and although Christopher Halliwell was married with children, he was actually one of Becky's regular clients. In fact, Halliwell had been sleeping with sex workers for years, I believe, and he had a bad reputation amongst the sex workers in Swindon because he would be very violent towards them during sex. He treated them awfully, and obviously one of the sex workers that he slept with often was Becky Gordon Edwards, so they knew each other fairly well. However, it's been suggested that Becky wasn't just like any other sex worker to Halliwell. He actually had a bit of an obsession with her. Apparently he was really infatuated with her. He had a huge crush on Becky and he wanted to be with her. And as I said, on the night of the 3rd of January 2003, Becky was picked up by Christopher Halliwell. Now, a friend of Becky's actually saw her arguing with a taxi driver that night, and she got out of his car and walked away. So, Becky and Halliwell clearly had some kind of feud. But then she was seen eventually getting back into his car, and the two drove away. And that was the last time that Becky was seen alive. We can't be 100% sure about exactly what happened that night. We don't know if their argument continued in the car and then Halliwell killed her out of anger or if maybe he killed her during sex because he could get very violent and aggressive during intercourse or perhaps he killed her out of anger because she turned him down. We know that Halliwell had an obsession with Becky so maybe he told her that he wanted more, he wanted a relationship and when she told him that she wasn't interested, he flew off the handle and murdered her. We don't know the circumstances surrounding her death. All we know for certain is that at some point that night, Halliwell strangled Becky to death and then he buried her body in a grave in Eastleigh. And she remained there in that grave in the field for over eight years until March of 2011 when her body was finally recovered after Halliwell took 
took Detective Stephen Fulcher to her burial site. So as soon as the body in East Leach was identified as being Becky Gordon Edwards, the police notified her family and they were of course devastated, absolutely devastated, but they were so relieved that her killer had been caught. And they were told by the police that he would be going away to prison for a very long time on a double murder charge. However, it turns out that it wouldn't be that simple. When Christopher Halliwell was taken back to the police station after he took the police to the locations of the girls' bodies, he was provided a solicitor. And in his next interview with the detectives, they were expecting him to just go through everything again, go through his confession. But under the advice of his solicitor, he chose not to do that. And instead he replied, no comment to every question he was asked. He chose to stay silent now, which was a big contrast to before. Before he told Detective Stephen Fulcher everything, even telling him about a murder that no one even knew about. And yeah, now he wasn't saying anything. He refused to give a formal confession. But regardless, on the 27th of March, 2011, Halliwell was charged with the murder of Sean O'Callaghan. And later on in April, when Becky was identified, Fight, he was charged with her murder too. So he was due to be going to trial for both killings. However, when the court proceedings began, Halliwell's defence team actually protested that his trial shouldn't even be going ahead because of Detective Stephen Fulcher and how he had broken the PACE law. PACE standing for the Police and Criminal Evidence Act of 1984. Some of you guys might have noticed this earlier on in the video but back in March of 2011 when Halliwell was arrested on suspicion of the kidnap of Sean, Detective Stephen Fulcher actually broke a lot of rules. There are strict rules when it comes to how police deal with suspects after they are arrested and these rules are outlined in the PACE law. I'm going to leave a link to some more information about the PACE laws in the description box because if I went through all of them now we would literally be here for hours. But to kind of sum it up, the PACE laws are in place to prevent police from mistreating and mishandling people that they arrest. It's to stop them from like forcing a confession out of someone and putting words in their mouths. When someone is arrested in the UK, the police are required to read them their rights, like their right to remain silent and stuff like that. The suspect is then cautioned and usually they are taken straight to a police station where they are given access to a lawyer. That is their right. However, in this case, like we talked about earlier, the police were allowed to continue conduct an urgent interview with Halliwell in the back of the police car because there was an immediate threat to life. They didn't know if Sean was dead or alive at this point and if she was alive somewhere they needed to know urgently where she was so that they could save her. So they were asking Halliwell questions such as is Sean still alive? Can you tell us where Sean is? But Halliwell just replied with no comment and he asked to be taken to a police station where he could speak to a solicitor as is his right. So at that point, according to the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, that is what the police should have done. They should have taken him to a police station. But as we know, that isn't what happened. Detective Stephen Fulcher told the officers that arrested Halliwell to drive to Barbary Castle where he would meet them there because he wanted to speak to Halliwell himself face to face. But still when they arrived, Halliwell refused to cooperate. He still said no comment and he actually asked quite a few times to be taken to the police station so that he could speak to a solicitor. But Steve Fulcher didn't take him to the station. He just kept asking Halliwell to tell him where Sean is and it got to the point where he was practically begging Halliwell, pleading with him to do the right thing. And eventually Halliwell did and he took them to Sean's body. And then after this, he agreed to take Steve Fulcher to the burial site of a second woman that he had murdered years earlier who would later be identified as Becky Gordon Edwards. Now again, according to the PACE laws, at that point Stephen Fulcher should have read Halliwell his rights and taken him back to the police station. 
but he didn't and he agreed to go with Halliwell to the burial site of the second victim. Christopher Halliwell was with Detective Stephen Fulcher that day for I believe about five or six hours and within that time frame there were several points where Stephen Fulcher should have followed the rules and taken him to the station and provided him with a solicitor. Detective Fulcher broke the law a lot that day and whilst many many people including myself can understand why he did what he did it was because he wanted to bring Sean home he wanted to save her if she was still alive out there somewhere he did not want to waste any time he didn't want to risk taking Halliwell back to the station where a solicitor would tell him to keep quiet because then they may never find Sean he did not want to risk that because he made a promise to Sean's family that he would bring her home he was prioritizing Sean life over some rules that he was supposed to follow. So like I said, whilst many people, the majority of people actually understood why he did what he did that day, the fact still remains that he broke the pace laws. And so when it came to his court proceedings for the murder of Sean O'Callaghan, his defence brought all of this up and they said that the trial shouldn't even go ahead because of Stephen Fulcher's actions. The defence basically suggested that Stephen Fulcher had forced or pushed Halliwell into making a confession because he told him that if he didn't own up and do the right thing he would be vilified in the press. I believe the defence actually twisted what Stephen said and they claimed that he told Halliwell that if he didn't confess he would personally go to the press himself and vilify him but that's not what Stephen meant at all when he said that. Anyway the defence argued argued that the trial shouldn't go ahead yet and they also argued that any evidence obtained by Stephen Fulcher in this case should be inadmissible during the trial. They should not be shown to the jury. So that was basically Halliwell's whole confession. Like I mentioned earlier on in the case, when Fulcher spoke to Halliwell that day, when he convinced him to take them to Sean, the whole time their conversation was being recorded by another officer, Deborah Peach. Well, not recorded as in taped, she was just writing down everything that they said so that it could be used later as evidence. But it never would be used used as evidence. Because Stephen Fulcher broke the rules, the judge agreed with the defence and ruled that Halliwell's confession could not be used as evidence during his trial. Now thankfully, when it came to Sean's case, the police didn't necessarily need that confession anyway because they had obtained forensic evidence that linked Halliwell to her murder. They found traces of Sean's blood in his taxi and in addition to that, his DNA was found on her body. So that was concrete evidence that he was her killer. And on top of that, they also had the CCTV footage of his taxi from the night of Sean's disappearance. So he could go to trial for her murder. There was enough evidence to prosecute him. But unfortunately, the same could not be said for Becky Godden Edwards. The only evidence they had linking Halliwell to her murder was that confession that he gave in which he led Stephen Fulcher to the location of her body. And as we know, the judge ruled that the confession could not be used during the trial. But that was all that they had. When Becky's body was found, she was just skeletal remains. So there was no chance of obtaining any forensic evidence. And so because the police had no evidence linking him to her case, the charges against Halliwell for Becky's murder were dropped. And her family were of course devastated and so so angry they felt like becky had been failed by the justice system they felt like becky was being treated as if she was nothing her life was worth nothing but they vowed that they would never ever give up the fight. Her mother especially decided that she was never going to stop trying to get justice for her daughter. But before we talk more about Becky's case, let me just tell you what happened with Sean's case. So because they had evidence, Sean's case could go to trial and originally Halliwell pleaded not guilty to the charge. However, in October of 2012, Christopher Halliwell changed this to guilty. He pleaded guilty to her murder 
murder. I imagine he did this because he realised that the forensic evidence they had against him was just way too strong. There was no way that he would be found not guilty if the case went to a jury. Although despite literally admitting his guilt, he actually tried to blame the victim, Sean, for what happened. He claimed that Sean was very, very drunk that night and that this led to her being violent and aggressive towards him after she got into his taxi. So he was basically suggesting that he killed her in self-defense. He was trying to defend himself against her, but as I'm sure you've probably guessed, no one believed this story. That just wasn't Sean at all. But anyway, obviously because Halliwell pleaded guilty, that meant that in the end, a trial didn't need to go ahead and he just had to be sentenced. For the murder of 22-year-old Sean O'Callaghan, Christopher Halliwell was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 25 years. So at the earliest, he would be considered for parole in 2038. Thankfully, Sean's family had received some form of justice for her death, but now the fight was on to get Halliwell sent down for Becky's murder too. So as I said, Becky's mother Karen knew that she was going to stop at nothing to get justice for her daughter. She set up a petition called Justice for Becky. She went on talks up and down the country. She did radio in interviews, television interviews, a campaign. She did absolutely everything she could to get Becky's case out there. She wanted Becky's story to get as much publicity as possible. And thankfully, all of her hard work and determination paid off because in early 2014, the Wiltshire police decided to reopen Becky's case and the case was taken over by a new officer, Detective Superintendent Sean Memory. He was going to try and find new evidence evidence that linked Halliwell to the murder of Becky Gordon Edwards. One of the things that Sean Memory decided to do as part of this new investigation was he was going to search Christopher Halliwell's house, the house that he used to live in with his family. Although I believe his family, so his partner and children, still lived there actually when they went to search it. But anyway, they went to search the house for any evidence and in the meantime, the detectives actually went to speak to Halliwell whilst he was in prison to see if maybe after a couple of years he would finally give a formal confession to Becky's murder that could be used as evidence. And Halliwell was kind of willing to cooperate with the police. He tried to basically make a deal with them. I'm going to try and include some of the footage from his interview in this video, but he basically said to the detectives, look, I will clear all of this up for you. I will give you what you want, a confession but only if you promise not to keep coming back to interview me every couple of years about something else. I can resolve the matter, but I don't want you coming back every couple of years, every five years, every ten years, whatever, with this, with this, with this, with something like that. As if, if it goes to court and I'm found guilty, that's it. They lock me up and throw me away the teeth. It kind of sounds to me in this interview that he is suggesting that he has killed other people, but he doesn't want the police coming back to him asking for more confessions in years to come if... I don't know, maybe other bodies are found. So yeah, he basically said to them, I will give you a confession. I will resolve all of this if you promise that that is the end of it, if you leave me alone. But the police said, no, they couldn't promise that. They couldn't promise that they would never come to speak with him again. And so he didn't give them a confession. So now the police had to work extra hard to try and find some other kind of evidence that linked him to Becky's murder and eventually they got the breakthrough that they needed. After searching Halliwell's home, they found several tools in his shed, one of which was a spade that hadn't been previously examined. So this spade was collected and sent off for testing and scientists actually found on this spade a tiny piece of soil. Now when this soil was tested, it was found that it was the same soil that was in the field 
revealed where Becky's body was buried. In fact, it matched almost identically. It was a very unique type of soil, apparently, and so this placed him in the field where Becky's body was found. This was the spade that he had used to dig her grave. It was also discovered that on the night that he killed Becky, his car ran out of petrol and it broke down about six miles away from the field where he had buried her, and so he had to call for roadside assistance. So again, that was extra evidence which put him near the scene of the crime and in addition to this it was also found through medical records that later that same day he went to his doctor because he had an injury to his hand. One of his fingers was actually broken and the doctor also noticed that he had like several scratches on his face. Now Halliwell told the doctor at the time that he sustained these injuries during a fight that he had had that day with a customer but when the police went and had a look through his work logs, it was determined that he hadn't actually been working that day. So he had lied, he hadn't had a fight with a customer and it's strongly believed that he sustained those injuries during the struggle with Becky while she was fighting for her life. So now, finally, the police had enough evidence to charge Halliwell with the murder of Becky Godden Edwards, although it actually turns out that in this court case, the judge ruled that the police were now allowed to use his earlier confession as evidence during the trial. The confession that he gave to Stephen Fulcher because he had already been convicted of murder before. So this was a huge success for the prosecution. Their case against him was now very, very strong. His trial began on the 5th of September 2016 and Halliwell decided to plead not guilty to the charges. Now, during the trial, Halliwell actually sacked his defence team and he decided that he was going to represent himself. I honestly have no idea why some killers do this. I've seen it happen a couple of times in true crime cases. They just decide to defend themselves and it never goes well. Very surprisingly, though, during the trial, whilst Halliwell was acting in his own defence, he actually got to cross-examine Stephen Fulcher the detective that literally caught him, he cross-examined him. And apparently when the cross-examination came to a close, Halliwell said to Stephen Fulcher, quote, it was a pleasure ruining your career, you corrupt bastard. We'll talk more about what he meant there in a second. At the end of his trial, Christopher Halliwell was found guilty of the murder of 20-year-old Becky Godden Edwards over 13 years after she was killed. And he was sentenced to life in prison with a whole life order so he will never ever be released and he will die in prison and his response to this was laughter he literally laughed at Becky's friends and family he never displayed any remorse or guilt for what he had done. Now going back to that comment that Halliwell made about ruining Stephen Fulcher's career well, that is effectively what he did. Like we talked about earlier, Stephen Fulcher broke many rules outlined in the PACE laws after Halliwell was arrested, and he was very heavily criticised for this. And it actually led to him being charged with gross misconduct for breaching the PACE guidelines. And when the case was presented in front of an independent panel organised by the Wiltshire Police, he was found guilty. And for this, he was was just given final warnings, warned not to do it again, I suppose, and he was allowed to keep his job in the police force. This all happened, by the way, in 2013. So this was in the gap between when Halliwell was convicted of Sean's murder in 2012 and when he was convicted of Becky's murder a couple of years later. And in May of 2014, Stephen Fulcher actually decided to resign as a detective from Wiltshire Police. But despite everything that happened to Stephen Fulcher in the aftermath of this whole case, I mean, he really did have a hard time. He was so heavily criticised. He was in the media spotlight. He really struggled financially. His family really struggled. But despite all of that, he says that he would still do the same again. He still would have taken the same course of action that he did the first time round because his number one priority right from the beginning 
was always Sean to bring her home. And who knows, had Stephen Fulcher not done what he did that day, then Becky may never have been found. Halliwell may never have confessed to her murder and given up the location of her remains. Yes, Stephen Fulcher broke the pace laws, but by doing that, he brought two young women back to their families. And that is the most important thing in my view. Stephen Fulcher has actually written a book about this whole case, which I am currently reading reading. I haven't finished it yet. I'm about a quarter of the way through, maybe like halfway through, um, but I'm really enjoying it so far. It's called Catching a Serial Killer, My Hunt for Christopher Halliwell, and I will leave a link to his book in the description box in case any of you guys are interested in reading it. There is also an ITV drama series about this whole case. It's called A Confession, and Martin Freeman plays Detective Stephen Fulcher. I haven't actually watched it yet, but I do plan on watching it soon so let me know in the comments if any of you guys have watched it I'd be really interested to know if you thought it was good but yeah that is it I guess for this case a pretty big one I feel like there have been a lot of twists and turns in this story a lot of people that look into this case actually believe that Christopher Halliwell was responsible for more than just two murders many people suspect that he is a serial killer and that the bodies of his other victims have even Either just never been found or he's just never been connected to any unsolved cases yet. In fact one case that people suspect he may have been linked to is that of Melanie Hall and I've actually covered Melanie's story on my channel before. She was a 25 year old woman that just suddenly disappeared one night in June of 1996 in Bath in Somerset and she went missing after a night out in a club just like Sean and Becky. For years, Melanie's case was just a missing persons investigation. However, in 2009, about 13 years after she was last seen, her skeletal remains were discovered in a bin bag near a slip road at Junction 14 of the M5 motorway. And her killer has never been found. To this day, her murder remains unsolved. But as I said, a lot of people believe that Halliwell was the one responsible, although I believe he was looked into as a a potential suspect by the Avon and Somerset police and I think they pretty much ruled him out. But if you want to learn more about Melanie's case then I will leave a link to my video in the description box. But yeah he is believed to have committed more murders especially in the gap between Becky and Sean's murder. I mean Becky was killed in 2003 and Sean in 2011. That's eight years. It seems very odd that he just went eight whole years without killing anyone else but if he did kill other people we may never know now and he'll probably take that secret to his grave anyway that is it for this video thank you so much for watching if you made it all the way to the end I feel like this video will be quite a long one um, before I go I would just like to say a huge thank you once again to HelloFresh for kindly sponsoring this video remember you can get the incredible offer of 14 free meals plus free shipping when you use my discount code which is 14 molly and go to hellofresh.com or you can go through my link in the description box as always please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on the case in the comments as well as any other cases that you would like to see me cover on the channel please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and i will see you again next week for another mystery with molly bye guys